Thank you. It's a very chilled out um, trailer for a subject which is actually quite intense. The idea that Jesus is coming to wage war on things that oppress us as human beings. Jesus versus. The Bible gives us a picture of our world and our reality as a world at war, that God is at war, that there is a, a conflict in a realm that we can't see, that we don't appreciate, that we don't have any way of being able to really see what's happening in a clear way, but the Bible says it really is happening. And when you know that you are at war, when you know that there's a war going on, it changes the way that you look at life. So we talked last week about the image of a family that go on holiday and they have a beach hut, a cabin, beachfront holiday, and that they have come to this place having a wonderful time, enjoying themselves, indulging themselves, doing all the things that they want to do. As much as I want to eat, I eat. As much as I want to enjoy myself, I enjoy myself. My whole deal is that I want to get the most out of it. But it's June the 5th, 1944, and they're on the Normandy beach. And that is the eve of D-Day. Now, before D-Day, before the landing of those thousands upon thousands of allied troops on that beach. It's okay to enjoy yourself. It's okay to just think of nothing but yourself. But as soon as June the 6th happens, you find yourself in a totally different reality. You're no longer in vacation mindset. You're now in warfare mindset. And so if the captain comes up to you and says, listen, we need to commandeer your cabin, you say, Absolutely, whatever I can do. When you're at war, when you have a war mentality, you figure, what can I do? I'll do as much as I can possibly do in order to aid the war effort. And everything about what I'm doing becomes not about my pleasure, my enjoyment, but it becomes about the fact that we're in a life and death struggle. And so it changes everything. Many people, they're Christians, but their mentality is vacation. Their mentality is consumer. That Christianity, church, is something that I do just so that I feel good about myself, so that I can just live my life with a little bit of Jesus on the top. But very rarely do we as Christians have a seriousness about the fact that we are at war. And last week we talked about the really surprising thing that the Bible says when it says that essentially... The ruler of this world is actually Satan, a dark angel, the god of this age, the Bible calls him. And Satan has control of the world, but the Bible tells us that Jesus comes to destroy the works of the evil one. So Jesus, the reason that Jesus was revealed was to destroy the devil's work. And when we get into that idea that Jesus has come to oppose the things that destroy us, that hurt us, that harm us, it changes everything about how we view our own faith and how we view what we do as Christians. So this week, we want to talk about Jesus versus greed. Now, if you're not a Christian, if you're not used to church, if you are been brought along or you're slightly on the outside looking in, I want to tell you, I've got some great news for you. This message that I am about to deliver is not for you. You don't have to do anything of this that I am saying. You can legitimately just sit back, enjoy it, and feel the Christian next to you squirming in their seat. So you get a free pass on this one. It may be interesting to you. You may be uh, just a little bit more informed in knowing how Christians think about greed, how Christians think about money. But you don't have to do anything. We don't normally talk about money. We don't do offerings every week. In fact, we do them fairly irregularly. But uh, we do want to talk about money from time to time because it is part and parcel of our Christian discipleship. And it's something that Jesus talked about. Jesus talked about it a whole lot. But before I get into this topic, I want to ask everybody a question. Whether you're a Christian, not a Christian, not sure, somewhere sitting on the fence. Here's the question. Do you want to be rich? If you want to be rich, put your hand up. And it's okay. It's not a trick question. I'm not going to guilt you afterwards. But genuinely, I, I want to know. Who here wants to be rich? Hands up. Define rich. Will you define rich? According to your own definition of rich, I'm talking about financial wealth. Do you want to be rich? Hands up. 
Okay, most people's hands go up because most of us feel like our lives would be better if we had a little bit more money. And it's not a bad thing. The Bible doesn't condemn rich people. Rich people were part of Jesus' followers. Rich people were the part of the way that Jesus was able to do what he did. He doesn't say that you shouldn't be rich. He doesn't say that it's morally wrong. He doesn't say that money is evil. He talks about the love of money being the root of all kinds of evil. But money in itself, it's, it's, it's neutral. It's, it's a resource. And some people get to be rich. The Bible says if you're rich, don't be proud. Be generous. So do you want to be rich? And most of us, if I caught it right, most of us here in this place, we want to be rich. And that's not a bad thing. We would love to have more money. You'd love to be in a place where you're financially comfortable. Maybe you don't want to be mega rich, you know, with the kind of rich where people hassle you all the time, want to get your stuff. But we want to have a good lifestyle. We want to have money. And the Bible talks a lot about money. You'd be surprised how much the Bible talks about money. Money. So when it comes to prayer, in the whole of the Bible, there are about 500 verses on the subject of prayer. When it comes to faith, there's actually less than 500 verses in the whole Bible on faith. But when it comes to money, the Bible talks about money, money and possessions. There's 2,000 plus verses on money. So in the Gospels, which give us our best, clearest account of Jesus, one in ten verses in the Gospels are about money. So that's 288 verses. And people will tell you that out of the 38 parables that Jesus told, 16 of them were about money or about possessions. Now, sometimes he was using money and possessions as a kind of metaphor. So they're not all directly about how you handle finance, but a great deal more than you think about Jesus talked about money. We tend to think that Christianity is about you know, doing good and being loving and, and, and forgiving and all of those kinds of things. And sometimes if you're not a Christian and you look at Christians, you think that all they want to talk about is sex and about heaven and hell and all those kinds of things. But in a very real way, Jesus talks more about money and how we handle the resources that we have, how we handle the possessions that we have. He says he talks about that way more than almost anything else because it's a crunch issue. And actually, it's one of those things that Jesus declares war on. Not money per se, because like we said, money's neutral. Money's not morally right or wrong. It's just a thing. It's a resource. But he talks about Greed. Now, when I talk about greed, by the way, that, that sneeze was from Kate Gennardo. Am I right? Um, I would just like to take a little moment here. I, this is kind of probably a, a little bit awkward and wrong. But uh, I would just like to, I would like to shout out. Okay, it's Mother's Day today, and she is the Metro mother. She takes care of you. She buys you donuts. She's just taken a bunch of girls out to get them measured up for their dresses for the Met Gala. She is the ultimate mother. So when you see Kate at the end, just give her a little pat on the back and uh, whatever you want to do. Maybe don't pat her on the back. That's weird. Um, <laughs> I'm kind of just saying we love you, Kate, and uh, it's wonderful to have a mother figure in the church. And so I hope you all got in touch with your mums today, sent them flowers, sent them nice thoughts, and made them feel good. But if you didn't, Kate is your substitute, so you can go and salve your conscience with her. So, where was we? We were talking about greed. When we talk about greed, greed's the kind of thing that everybody says, well, I don't have a problem with greed. I'm not a greedy person. If I ask you to put your hands up again, how many people think that they're greedy? Matt Miles, yeah, well, okay, all the back row, people just making a point now. Um, most of the time, in reality, we don't think of ourselves as greedy. When you think of greed, you think of Scrooge McDuck. He's counting all his gold coins, cackling with glee. You tend to think about that being greed. You tend to be Thinking about the one percenters, the people that have everything, that just ride roughshod over the common, everyday person. And uh, we have this elevated idea of greed. But Jesus spoke against greed time and time and time again. He says, greed is corrosive. 
Greed is one of the things that Jesus wants to come against. He wants to oppose it because it will actually have a negative impact on our souls. It will actually compete for our attention. It will seduce us away from the battle. So instead of having a warfare, war mentality, we'll just have a consumerism. I just am in it for me. And so Jesus spoke about greed. And one of those parables that we mentioned that um, highlights the times that Jesus talks about money is one that I want to bring us to now. I want to bring our attention to it. And we're going to talk about this and then get really practical towards the end. The situation is this. Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem. So it's the last leg of his kind of ministry tour. Luke, who was a doctor, starts off as a doctor, becomes a historian. He gathers the eyewitness accounts from the disciples like Peter. They were there. They witnessed it. He writes it down in his Gospel of Luke. And he gets those little details which only eyewitnesses pick up. The fact is that at this particular juncture, Jesus is surrounded by this huge crowd. And Luke records that there was thousands and thousands and thousands of people. And he says they were trampling on one another. And this crowd was kind of unruly and boisterous. And although Jesus started talking and teaching with his disciples, the whole crowd got in and they started throwing questions at him because he's like this big, he's got bigger and bigger. And now as he finally makes his way to Jerusalem where he will be crucified, people are just throwing questions at him. This one guy in the crowd shouts out and he says, Master, tell my brother to share the inheritance with me. The brother has had inheritance. He's got the whole lot. His parents left the whole lot to him. And this aggrieved person is saying, tell him to share. You know, it's not right. Do the right thing. Tell him. And Jesus, instead of answering this person's particular issue, he paints us a big, broad principle which works for us today. And he tells a parable which is a story with a point, a made-up story with a real point. And he says this. He said to them, watch out, be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Everyone say all kinds of greed. Because there's not just one type of greed. You can have the greedy 1% kind of greed, but you can also have comfortable middle class kind of greed. You can have Poor people having greed. Greed is one of those things which is a human issue. It's, we're all subject to the power of greed. And it, come, it can come in many different forms. And so Jesus says, I want you to be on your guard, on the watch. Be careful about all kinds of greed. He says, because life does not consist in abundance of possessions. Now, I said that if you're not a Christian, then this message is not for you. You can just listen in and (laughs) gloat. Uh, But actually, this one is is quite a big deal. If you're not a Christian, you might want to take this one on board. You might actually want to take this and live according to this. Because Jesus says something its so profound about life. He says, you need to understand that life isn't about the abundance of possessions that you have. There's more to life than the stuff that you consume and the stuff that you own and the stuff that you accumulate. And so much of our thinking, even to date more than ever, is my life is about how much stuff I can get. Whoever dies with the most toys wins. We have that kind of consumerist, materialistic mentality. But Jesus says, life does not equal stuff. That's what you need to know. That's the equation that you need to get a hold of. Because it's so easy to get sucked in, thinking my status comes from the kind of car that I drive or the house that I get. And we're always trying to find our worth and our value in stuff. And actually, it leads you down a path of greed. And so Jesus, before he even starts the story, just a scene setter, he says, you just need to be careful and on the lookout for greed because it will come to you where you least expect it. It won't come presenting like you think it will. It will sneak in through the back door. All kinds of greed. And it starts with that assumption that life is about stuff. And Jesus says, you need to know life is not about stuff. And if you can get that one thing straight in your brain, in your heart, then it will affect the way that you live. And it will be so much better for you. But he told them this parable. He says, the ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Now, at this point, everybody who's listening to Jesus says, well, that's just typical, isn't it? The guy is rich, and then the ground that he has produces an abundance 
of crops. So he's got way more than he can possibly know what to do with. Isn't that just typical? The rich get richer. The poor get children. We have this kind of thing, the world that we live in. People that have seem to have more. It seems to go right for them. But the danger here is that you think, well, you know, I'm not a rich person. I'm not rich. I'm not wealthy. You may be here. You're a student. I got student debt. I have difficulty. Bristol's a very costly place to live. Maybe you're a young professional. You know, I'm working. I need all my money just to be able to keep my head above water. I don't feel rich. And yet when Jesus talks about riches, we need to count ourselves into this equation. Because compared with the world's population, we are fantastically, incredibly rich. I remember a few years ago, I was in Zimbabwe. Went to visit there just to look at some stuff that we'd been supporting through Love Running. And we were in the rural uh, part of Zimbabwe. So Zimbabwe, one of the poorest countries in the world, and we were in the poorest part of this poor country. We were staying in a hotel. Um, My daughter Zoe was with me, and uh, she was 13 at the time. We were staying in a hotel. It was a luxury hotel. You knew it was luxury because every morning at six o'clock, a houseboy came and poured a bucket of hot water into your bucket so that you could have a, a warm sponge bath. Luxury. So that was the kind of situation that we were in. And we were going to these villages and we would see how the money that we had supported and and raised through Love Running was affecting this community. And we had this one guy and uh, he was a pastor of the church in the community. And he was giving us a tour around and he took us to this one house, dirt poor, like a shack, little kind of scrabbly, dusty courtyard that they had. And it had some pigs in it in a little enclosure. And the, the pastor's then, he's wearing his suit. It's kind of a, a, a shaggy, baggy, not fitting suit. But he's, he seems incredibly well aware of his congregation. So these people are obviously very, very poor, but he knows very much intimate their details and how they live their lives. And so he's telling us all about this family and the pigs and where they got the pigs. I'm thinking, man, this guy really knows about this poor, poor, poor family with their pigs. He's a really good leader. And, you know, we've got a lot in common because we get to lead churches and he's in touch with the poor people in his church. And it was only after 20 minutes of him showing me around that I finally realized this is his house. This was his house. He was the poor, poor, poor guy who only had just three or four pigs in his whole. Um, th- those were his total possessions. That's how he supported himself. And then later on, we went to another house, and uh, we had this fried chicken that was offered to us. And we we're like, oh, we, we kind of have to go because we're late for the next thing. And the pastor came over and said, no, you need to stay. You need to eat this chicken. Because they literally just killed the chicken that you were playing with earlier. And and now you're eating it. And uh, they only get to eat meat once. I'm like, what, really? They only have meat once a week? He says, no, Philip. They only have meat once a year. And they're sharing it with you. That is what poor is. And compared to that, I am rich beyond their wildest imaginings. And you are rich beyond their wildest imaginings. While billions of people around the world live on less than a dollar a day, have no access to even clean water, sanitation. We live in wealth. It's just that greed has this way of thinking that you never have enough. And so this man, the farmer, he has incredible bumper crop this particular year. And he's got this kind of Issue. He says, what am I going to do? I've got so much. And then he said, this is what I'll do. Brilliant idea. I'll tear down my barns and build bigger ones. Everyone say build bigger ones. And there I will store my surplus grain. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. And so he's saying, look, I've got a great solution. I've got so much crops, so much harvest, so much grain. It won't fit into my present barns. So I'll tear them down. I'll build bigger barns. I'm not going to eat it all. I'm not going to blow it. I'm not going to be lavish. I'm not going to do anything crazy. I'm actually going to think about the future. I'm going to be wise. Most people that Jesus is speaking to, as they listen to him, they think, that sounds like a great 
idea. That sounds like really wise financial planning. You have a windfall. You don't eat it all at once. You don't consume it all at once. You save some for a rainy day. In fact, he won't have to work ever again. He will never have to have any worries about money, about what his provisions are ever, ever again. We call this bigger barn thinking. Bigger barn thinking is the way that we think about Finances. It's the way that our culture, our society, our world tells us this is good, smart financial thinking. Bigger barn means when you have more, you increase your capacity. When more comes to you, you increase your ability to store it, to consume it, to hoard it, to save it, to keep it. You put it away. And what do you do with it? You eat, you drink, you be Mary, if it comes to you, it must be for you. If you get it, it must be for your benefit. It's bigger barn thinking. And our whole world is filled with bigger barn thinking. You never get to a point where you think, right, this is the lifestyle that I'm happy to have. You never think, well, I'm already at the top of the tree globally. I'm already the one percenter compared with most people in the developing world. You never think, well, you know, I'll just stick at that level, it's always bigger barn. So you think, right, I'm studying right now, so I expect to be poor. But one day, I'm going to get a proper job, so I'll get a bigger barn. And then when I've got that job, I've got an entry-level job. Maybe it's a grad scheme. Maybe it's a, 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 a bottom rung of the ladder kind of career move. And then I'll move up the ladder so I can get a bigger barn. And when I've done that, I'll increase a bigger barn, a bigger barn. When you get more salary, ah, we can now live a little bit better. You get more income, ah, I can now have a better car. You get more finances, you think, right, now I can have a, a, a more exotic holiday. I can eat out more. I can drink more. I don't have to go to Weatherspoons anymore. I can now go to the picture and piano. I've made it. You know, I've got a bigger barn mentality. We used to have these phones. I remember when the first iPhone came out. I remember when I first saw it. A friend of mine, we were speaking at a conference together. He pulls out this phone. Look, I have an iPhone. I'm like, oh my goodness, an actual iPhone. And it was like a big deal because this guy went to school with Jonathan Ive who designed the iPhone. And so his old school friend sent him this iPhone. It's like, oh my goodness. Listen, you give me the iPhone now, I wouldn't even spit on it. An iPhone 1? You've got to be kidding. This thing that was like this magic piece of wizard tech 10 years ago, now I wouldn't even give it to my kids because they're like, Dad, seriously? No, you get a bigger barn, you get a better phone. And now we have these great phones and when it, you know, when it's now obsolete, the next one comes out, you go buy the better phone. It's the bigger barn. Back in the old days, old people like your grandparents, when they had something, they would keep the thing until it broke. And then you know what they would do. They would get it fixed and carry on using that same thing. Now, a little bit of a better camera, I need a bigger barn. Now, slightly faster way of opening up Candy Crush, I need a bigger barn barn. We're always on to the next thing. And this is what the Bible calls a kind of greed. And it's a greed that says everything that you get should be for you. You earned it. So the guy's there. He's, it's my farm. It's my land. It's my ground. Sure, I didn't make the crops come up. Sure, it wasn't me that caused this bumper harvest. But it's for me. It's my stuff. And because I've got more, then I need bigger Barns. And bigger barn thinking is an insidious thing that will creep into your heart and corrode your soul. And even though we live in the affluent West, we're in a situation where the number one cause of marital breakdown in the UK today consistently is reported as being financial worries. Most people live with huge amounts of debt. The average person in the UK spends more than they earn. They spend 10% more than their income. We have this bigger barn, bigger barn, never satisfied. And it says, everything that I have, it all comes to me. It's all for me. I choose what I will do with it. 
And although the world says this is a wise way to live and this makes perfect sense, Jesus says, do you know what? It's wrong. And do you know what? One day God's going to speak to you and this is what he's going to say to you. He's going to say to you the same thing that he says to the man in this story. But God said to him, you fool. You completely lack any sense of doing the right thing. You're not being financially wise. You're a fool. He says, this very night, your life will be demanded from you. And then he asks this brilliant question. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? Bigger barn thinking, I prepared it. It's for me. It's for myself. I earned it. I deserve it. I got it. I have every right. It's for my pleasure, for my use. It's for my consumption. I see myself as a consumer. I see myself as someone who is just rising up the ladder. And God says, you fool. You're a fool because you didn't get the bigger picture. You lack perspective. You only see what's in front of of you. You only see what is in front of your face and you think, well, I get more money, then I have a better lifestyle. I get a bigger house. I move into a better neighborhood. God says, this is not the right way to think because you're totally discounting the fact that you are living a short period of life on this planet, in this phase. And instead of investing your money where it could do good and incredible, have an incredible impact, you just soaked it all in on yourself. You need to know that your life can be required of you just like that. The, the life that you think that you have and you have no thought of God, no thought of eternity, no thought of the life to come, no thought of the age that is to be. One day you're going to stand before God. And for me, it's an incredible tragedy that for this guy, the first clear thing that he heard God say to him was, you fool, you fool. Now who's going to get all this stuff that you have prepared for yourself? You saved it for you, but you're not going to get it because ultimately you don't own anything. The idea of ownership is an illusion because you have all this stuff, you have all these possessions that you've accumulated, but you don't really own them because once you've gone, you can't take them with you. And God says, look, all that stuff that you got for you is now going to go to someone else. You thought it was all for you, but it was never, ever, always going to be for you. You had the chance to do something powerful with your money, but instead you just fell into this greed trap of thinking everything that I have is for me. And what Jesus wants to take us from is instead of bigger barn thinking, he wants to move us into build better thinking. Build better thinking is this. It says, I don't just view everything that I have as a resource for me to dispose of as I see fit. I see the resources that have been entrusted to me as just that, a trust. And I get to steward them and manage them. And of course, God wants me to enjoy that. God doesn't want me to wrap myself up in sackcloth and just turn my back on every kind of material pleasure and comfort. But it is primarily something that I can use in order to advance his kingdom. I can use this. For the war effort. So when the captain comes to my cabin, I say, sure, use it. Take what you have. Let me give everything that I can. You don't think, how much can I hold on to? Hey, this is my pleasure. This is my time. No, you think, we're at war. I want to give and support the war effort. And sacrifice is worth it because I'm seeing a bigger picture. And so Jesus summarizes the whole thing. He says, this is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves. So anybody, I don't care who you are, you store up treasure just for yourself, that's bigger barn thinking. And one day God is going to have something to say about that. But rather build better. Instead of, it then goes on, who's not rich toward God. So you can build a bigger barn or you can build better. Bigger barn thinking or build better. Better. Be rich toward God. So now here's my second question. It's this. Do you want to be rich toward God? Don't want you to put your hand up. 
Because this is actually a big deal. To be rich toward God means that I take the resources that he has given me in the first place and I say, how can I give to God? How can I be rich toward God? Now, I want you, and this is, I know it's uh, talking about money and it's awkward, but I want you to have the benefit of being rich. Not all of us can be rich materially, financially in this world, but every single one of you here listening to me right now, you can be rich toward God. And if I had to choose between being rich just on its own in this earth and being rich toward God, I choose being rich toward God. God. I want to be rich toward God. I want to be a millionaire in God's eyes. Why? Because I give generously. So how do we be rich toward God? How do we do giving? And it's a really good question to ask because normally at Metro, we don't talk a lot about money. Once or twice a year, max, that's when we talk about it like we're talking about it now. But actually, we do have a pattern. We have a pattern which we think is a New Testament Pattern. And it's a pattern that helps people have a habit, a lifestyle of giving, of generosity. So not just I give when I'm asked or when I'm guilted or when something comes up, but a lifestyle where I am investing my life and I'm rich toward God, whether I've got a lot of money or a little bit of money. And this comes from Paul when he was doing business with the early church. And he gave up this pattern to the early church. He said, this is how I want you to do Um, your giving, because I don't want to do offerings. I don't want to do offerings when there's a big emotional appeal and you just fish around for what's in your pocket at the time. I want you to have a lifestyle where you're developing generosity and richness towards God. And so he says this, On the first day of every week, each one of you should set aside a sum of money in keeping with your income, saving it up so that when I come, no collections will have to be made. Everyone say, no collections. Three stages to this, three principles. First of all, it says on the first day of every week. That means it's predetermined. No getting to the end of the month and just thinking, well, how much money do I have left? Well, I can afford this or I can't afford that. But rather, before you spend anything, before you make any other financial commitment, you're giving to God, your generosity to God, your richness that you're storing up with God in his account, that comes first. And it's predetermined. Determined. It's premeditated. Secondly, it's personal. Each one of you. He says, look, this is not down to something that everyone tells you what to do. This is between you and God. So when Jesus talked about giving, he says, when you give to your father, do it in secret so that the left hand doesn't know what the right hand is doing. It's a personal thing. It's your choice. But then finally, it should be proportional. He says, in keeping with your income. Now, if you've been around church a little bit more, you'll have heard of things called tithing. Tithing is an Old Testament practice where people were encouraged to give 10% of what they have to God. But tithing is a great model. It's a great template. It's a great kind of starting point, but it's not in the New Testament. All that Paul says is it should be in keeping with your income. So you may want to give 10%, but you may not have that much margin. You'll just die. You won't be able to pay your bills. You get thrown out of your house. But it may be that 10% will be too small for you. I know some church leaders who tithe 90% of what they have. They give 90% of their income because their income is high enough or they've got other means to support themselves that they can give generously. These guys are like multimillionaires before God. They're rich toward God. For myself and Kate, we kind of aspire to give 20% of what we have. We want to give to the point where it feels uncomfortable. I want to think about how much am I happy to give and then give a little bit more, just so it pushes me over the edge. Just so when I pray, dear God, our Father in heaven, give us this day our daily bread, I actually mean it. And when I talk about giving, I'm talking about giving in the same way that Paul, the apostle, was talking. I'm talking about giving to the church. I'm talking about giving to the church. That's the way that we do what we do. We're only able to give because people supply the money. We're not some kind of corporate entity. We're a community that everyone uh, gives into. So this giving, it's predetermined, it's personal, and it's proportional. 
We're going to end in just a moment. I'm going to give you an opportunity to reflect on what you want to do with giving. But what I will say is this. If you feel you're a part of Metro, you should be giving to Metro. That's why I say if you're not part of church, this is not for you. Don't worry about this. You can relax. If you feel that you're part of this church, then you need to be giving to this church because this is how we do what we do. Now, if you say to me, Philip, I want to give, but I have other things that I give to, and I, I, I save the whale, and I, I, I eat the, the banana, or whatever it may be, um, you know, I recycle. I don't want to give to church because I like to be able to say where my money is going. I'll say, that's great. But actually, scripturally, biblically, if you want to be a disciple of Jesus, then you need to be contributing to the costs of the community. You need to be giving in to the war effort. Then some of you will say, yeah, but I'm not really sure that I completely trust that the church will do good things with my money. If I have control, then I can tell where it's going to go, and I know that it's going to where I want it to go. And I just say this, if you don't trust us with your money, then you really shouldn't be part of this church. Because if you don't trust us with the finances, then how on earth can you trust us with your own spiritual care and well-being? And if you don't trust us with the money in your pocket, then you just, in one sense, you call yourself a member, but your heart is not really with us. Because where your treasure is, Jesus says, there your heart will be also. So if you don't feel that you trust this church or you think that you know we're all going to spend it on Mother's Day gifts for Kate or whatever, then, then that's fine. Find another church where you do trust them. The reality is this. We're a church that has grown so much, and uh, we have far outgrown our income. And so other people have to support us. We don't have very many people that are paid by the church. We only have one full-time <laughs> worker in this church, and it's not me. I work two jobs in order to do this, and I give as much as I can possibly give. We're committed to that. Most of the people that have any kind of input and spend time here, do it out of basically the kindness and the goodness of their own hearts. But it does mean that we have a £24,000 deficit. That means that every year that we exist, we fall short of breaking even by £24,000. That's £2,000 a month. And do you know what? I would quite like to see us deal with that thing tonight. Because currently, less than one in three people who are a part of Metro, who are in a hub, who come here regularly on a Sunday, less than one in three give anything into the church. And so I want you to think, how can I be rich toward God? How rich do I want to be? How generous do I want to be before God? So we could give 10 people who could give 200 pounds a month. We do it. We solve it. And you might say, yeah, I can do that. I got a good job. Uh, I could give 200 pounds a month. Me and 10 other people would do it. That's it. We're sorted. The church is good. Not just so that we can keep our head above water, but because we believe that God has called us to do great things in this city. And when you give to this war effort, you're giving to something beyond you. We believe that this thing that we're doing right now will outlast us, outlive us, have an impact in the city for decades to come, have a transformational impact upon the city of Bristol. We have such big plans. If I told you them, you would laugh. You'd laugh out of disbelief and you'd laugh for joy. But we need to be giving to the war effort. Otherwise, Satan lulls us into a vacation consumer mentality. So 10 people could give 200 Or 20 people could give 100. You could be one of the 20 giving 100 pounds a month. Or it may be that 50 people give 40 pounds a month. Now you might say, I don't have very much money. I don't have very much money. When I get a job, when I get some more money, then I'll give. Ah, wrong. Does not work like that. It's about your heart. You don't have a money problem, you have a heart problem. If you can give when you don't have much, then you'll give when you do have much. The fact of the matter is, the more that people have, the less the proportion that they give. It's the opposite. You will not give more when you have more. You will give less unless you learn now 
how to see yourself as part of God's war effort when all the resources that God graciously gives to you because he trusted you to be born and brought up in the affluent West, when you give those resources richly towards God, then you see how he can deal with you. And suddenly it changes your heart and the ripple effect goes through all your financial dealings. So this is how you can give. You go to the website, woodlandsmetro.church slash giving, and you can sign up to give a regular amount. It's going to be premeditated. You do it um, first. It's got to be personal. It's what you decide, not what I tell you. Some of you, you say, actually, I can give 5%. I'd love to make it 10% one day, but right now, 5% is as much as I can give. And even that makes my eyes pop out. And then it's, it's proportional. It's got to reflect a good proportion of what you have. So in a minute, the band are going to come. But what I want to do is I want to ask and invite the team just to come around. We've got these little slips that we want to give you. So Kate and uh, Precious, I think, are going to come around. They're going to give you one of these. I want you to pass them along the rows. If you've got a big gap between you and the person next to you in the row, then just move it over so that they can get it too. And all it says is, my total income is, you fill it in, the percentage I aspire to give away is, and then you fill that in. That's what you want to do eventually one day. The percentage I can give away right now is, that's what you write, what you can actually handle right now. So maybe you aspire to be giving 50% of your income when you're a rich accountant or whatever. Uh, but right now, you're super poor, so you can only give five. But you, you write something of what you can give and what you want to do in the future. And then you pledge what you want to pledge each month to the Metro War effort. Now, I'm not asking you to give these back to me. I am never, ever going to see these. This is for you. But all I want you to do is take the pen that you've got under your chair and just as the band come up and we start to do the first song... I just want you to do this and use it as an opportunity to reflect. So you're thinking through. And then you've got the website address. You can go and you can actually activate that later on. And I'm hoping and praying that some of you will see this, that you'll get it. And you say, I don't want to be just someone that lives the greedy lifestyle, the bigger barn thinking. I want to build better. I want to invest what I've got to becoming rich with God so I can resource God's work to advance God's kingdom in God's world. Okay? So I'm going to pray, but I want you to take this, write it out, and take it home with you, and uh, hopefully in the next couple of days, actually make this thing a reality. For those of you that are already giving, that's fantastic. Thank you so much. You can carry on. But for the rest of us, I want us just to do this. I know that it's a little bit awkward. We don't like to talk about money. I don't like to talk about money. I feel like a used car salesman. But I do think it's important because Jesus spoke about money so, so much. And he calls us to be people that use our money to advance his kingdom. So let's pray right now. Father God, I thank you. I thank you for your grace. I thank you that you've trusted us with material possessions and wealth. Wealth beyond the imagination of so many people hundreds and thousands of millions of people on this planet. And I want to pray, Lord God, that you keep us from guilt. Lord, I want to pray that you just erase anything that I've said which is unhelpful or which is emotionally blackmailing. But I pray, dear Father, that with clear eyes and open hearts, we'd be able to make strong commitments to you with how we do our finances. And I pray that we put into practice habits and disciplines that stay with us for a lifetime. And I want to pray, Father God, that you'd help us wipe out this uh, huge deficit that we have so that we can go further forward in your kingdom work. In the name of Jesus, amen.